This section provides a brief introduction to likelihood ratios, a probability concept actively used to construct predictive data mining models. This brief presentation was organized by Dr. Alemi and is narrated by Yara Alemi. Likelihood is a common statistical concept and is widely used. In probability theory, likelihood ratio is used to indicate how informative knowledge of one piece of information will be for predicting another event. Let's call the variable that we want to predict the dependent variable and all other variables predictors. The likelihood ratio measures the association between each predictor and the dependent variable. Note that likelihood ratio is simply a measure of association, even though conceptually we often think of the predictor occurring before the dependent variable. Likelihood can be used to measure the relationship between risk factor and outcome, and it can be used to measure the role of a datum or clue in the inference task. The best way to think of the likelihood ratio is to imagine it as a ratio of two conditional probabilities. Conditional probabilities were introduced in an earlier video. A likelihood ratio is the ratio of the probability of the predictor when the dependent variable occurs divided by the probability of the predictor when the dependent variable does not occur. The likelihood ratio of a risk factor is the ratio of the probability of observing the risk factor among patients with the outcome divided by the probability of observing the same risk factor among patients without the outcome. The prevalence of the risk factor is examined in two different subpopulations. On top, the group that has the outcome, and on the bottom, the group that does not have it. In summary, likelihood ratios measure how informative a predictor is. The likelihood ratio shows how many times the odds of an outcome change when the risk factor is present. A risk factor with a likelihood ratio of 2 tells us that the odds of the outcome are doubled when the risk factor is present. A likelihood ratio of 5 tells us the odds change five-fold. The ratio can be anywhere from 0 to infinity. A value of 0 indicates that patients who have this predictor never have the dependent variable. So 0 is in fact very informative, but in the negative direction. A ratio near zero indicates that the dependent variable will almost never happen. A ratio of one indicates that the predictor is not informative, and there is a 50-50 chance that the dependent variable will occur. Therefore, even if we know that the predictor has occurred, we know no more information about the likelihood of the dependent variable than we did before. A ratio of 10 means the predictor increases the odds of the dependent variable by 10-fold. Notice how the further the ratio is from 1, the more informative it is. The relationship between risk factor and outcome can also be examined in a contingency table. The likelihood ratio in this context tells us how informative the risk factor is in predicting the outcome. The contingency table reports the number of times outcome and the risk factor co-occur. We can therefore calculate the likelihood ratio from this data. Remember that likelihood ratios are defined as the ratio of two conditional probabilities. Using the contingency table, we can calculate these two conditional probabilities as seen here. The two conditional probabilities are the presence of the risk factor given the patient has the outcome being assessed and the presence of the risk factor given that the patient does not have the outcome being assessed.
These two probabilities help determine the likelihood ratio. It is important to understand the relationship between likelihood ratio and prior and posterior odds. Prior odds is defined as the probability of the outcome occurring divided by the probability of it not occurring. So it is a measure of how likely the outcome is before we even consider the risk factor. Posterior odds is the odds of the outcome after we have considered the risk factor. Likelihood ratio connects prior odds to the posterior odds. In this sense, likelihood ratio tells us how we should revise our prior uncertainty in the light of the observation of the risk factor. This formula is known as the Bayes formula. We will return to this formula after we've examined some examples. This table here shows the co-occurrences of repeated infections and substance abuse. Here we have a sample of 54 patients, nine of whom were later treated for substance abuse. We want to know how informative repeated infections are in predicting that the patient will or has had substance abuse. We can use a likelihood ratio to answer this question. Like before, this likelihood ratio is calculated as the ratio of two conditional probabilities, calculated in the two different subsets of patients. On the numerator, we have the prevalence of repeated infections among patients with substance abuse. And on the denominator, we have the same prevalence now calculated among patients without substance abuse. The frequency of repeated infections are calculated in two different subsets of data. Using the counts, the likelihood ratio can be calculated as the number of times abuse and repeated infections occurred among patients with the abuse, divided by the number of times no abuse and repeated infections occurred among patients with no abuse. We note that 67% of the time, repeated infections occurred among patients with substance abuse, and 56% of the time, they occurred among patients with no substance abuse. Therefore, our likelihood ratio is calculated to be 1.2. A likelihood ratio of 1.2 is higher than 1, so repeated infections increase the odds of current or future substance abuse. It increases these odds by 1.2 times. We can use this number to report how informative repeated infections are. When a combination is rare, we may not find any cases in our data, even when we have massive data sets. Then the calculation of likelihood ratio becomes more difficult. Here we see data on 54 patients, and we would like to know if the presence of shock predicts the presence of diabetes. So in other words, we're looking to calculate the likelihood ratio of shock in predicting diabetes. The calculated likelihood ratio is zero. A likelihood ratio of zero is a very strong statement. A likelihood ratio of zero essentially says that in predicting whether or not the patient is diabetic, we can ignore everything else if we observe that the patient is in shock. After all, when the odds of an event become zero, no other piece of information can change these odds to a number higher than zero. This is particularly problematic in using rare conditions to predict if the patient is diabetic. The fact that diabetes and shock have not co-occurred in our sample of 64 patients may simply be due to the fact that our sample size is small. In a larger sample, we may see a diabetic patient in shock, in which case the likelihood ratio would be near zero, but not zero. Statisticians have proposed several different methods for dealing with likelihood ratios of zero. For example, one could assume that the next case would demonstrate both shock and diabetes. This will change the likelihood ratio to near zero, but not exactly zero. However, this estimate has a problem as our assumption was arbitrary and doesn't always indicate a proportional change. Plus, depending on the numbers of rows of data in the non-diabetic patients, 
we may have created a likelihood ratio that exceeds 1, which is obviously wrong for this data. The approach that we like is to estimate the likelihood ratio as the next smallest possible number for our sample. This estimation does not depend on the frequency of shock in non-diabetic patients, so the estimated likelihood ratio will always be less than 1 and as close to 0 as our sample allows. The division by 0 is another problem that can occur in the calculation of likelihood ratios. Here, we see a set of sample data where there is no one who has neuropathy among the non-diabetic patients. In calculating the likelihood ratio associated with neuropathy, we then run into a problem because we now have to divide by zero. Again, we can't calculate the likelihood ratio as an arbitrary number added to the cell with the zero value. Doing so would create situations where the estimated likelihood ratio is less than one, which clearly it should not be. The ratio should be a number larger than one. In fact, per our data, it should actually be a number close to infinity. Therefore, is our estimate of 23.25 reasonable? It's larger than one, but it's not very close to infinity. This even raises a more fundamental issue. What is an infinite number in this context? The largest number in our sample is our sample size. So any number beyond this sample side could be our estimate for an infinite number. So let's estimate the likelihood ratio as 1 plus the sample size. This method of estimation has several advantages. First, it will never be below 1, no matter what the conditional probability of neuropathy among diabetics is. This is important as one can construct situations where the addition of one case to the zero cell would lead to estimations for a likelihood ratio that is below one. This way of calculating the likelihood ratio guarantees that that never happens, which makes sure that our data makes sense. Secondly, and perhaps equally importantly, the estimate is proportional to the sample size. In larger samples, we will have more confidence that a zero cell is a real expectation and not simply due to small sample size. So, the fact that we can assign larger likelihood ratios to larger sample sizes also makes sense. The best way to use the concept of likelihood ratio to predict the probability of an event is to use the Bayes formula. The odds form of the Bayes formula tells us how our current odds for an event, known as prior odds, should be revised based on the likelihood ratio of the observed data. Then, posterior odds of the event can be reported as the product of prior odds and the likelihood ratio of the combined data. Bayes formula tells us how to predict the odds of an event from multiple clues in the data. Prior odds is the probability of an event occurring divided by the probability of the event not occurring prior to any examination of the information in the data. The likelihood ratio of the combined data under the assumption of independence is the product of the likelihood ratios of each piece of information. Naive Bayes is a probabilistic model that uses Bayes' formula even when the assumption of independence is not verified. It focuses on the part of the Bayes' formula where the data changes from patient to patient. Since prior odds is constant, we focus on the portions of the formula that shows the product of the likelihood ratios. This product shows how much the posterior odds, or in other words the dependent variable, will change as a consequence of the observed predictors. This change is calculated as the product of the likelihood ratios associated with the data. The capital Pi symbol here shows that a product is calculated across all likelihood ratios of the predictors. Remember, earlier in this lecture, we calculated the likelihood ratio associated with multiple infections as 1.2. And let's say we calculated the likelihood ratio associated with depression as 5. Then the naive Bayes analysis will allow us to estimate the odds of substance abuse as the product of these two likelihood ratios. But wait, 
While the Bayes formula allows us to examine the combined effects of multiple predictors and is fundamental in constructing predictive models in electronic health records that can depend on thousands of variables, there is a catch. We can use the simplified Bayes product rule only when the predictors are independent of each other. When several predictors co-occur, then the assumption of independence is clearly violated. And of course, predictors often co-occur. There is almost no data in which various predictors do not co-occur. In these situations, the assumption of independence is violated, and the odds form of the Bayes formula is no longer an accurate model. Therefore, we can't use the Bayes model without making an error in calculating our predictions. In this course, we're going to focus entirely on the use of the naive Bayes formula, because sometimes, even when we make the wrong assumptions, we can still arrive at the correct conclusions. In sparse, high-dimension data, where thousands of predictors are used simultaneously to estimate the odds of the dependent variable, and if these predictors rarely co-occur, and if when they do so, they are likely to lead to the same conclusion, then we can still arrive at the correct conclusion using the naive Bayes analysis. In these situations, the simple rule of multiplying likelihood ratios, even though theoretically wrong, will still yield the same conclusion, and therefore its use is still advised. Likelihood ratios measure how many times odds of an event should change because of observed data. Likelihood ratios can be used for generating predictive models. This has been the lecture on likelihood ratios. Thank you for listening.